With the turn of the 20th century, cameras begin their turning in Berlin. One of the earliest motion pictures finds Prince von Bismarck exhorting the Germans to love blood and iron. Meanwhile, at Windsor Castle, a dashing young lad who someday is to be the Prince of Wales recruits an army. His most trusted retainers are his brother, Albert, and his sister, Mary. And in Moscow, the Tsar of Russia, though he commands the greatest of armies, does not dwell long with his soldiers. prays to God to heal his invalid son. Germany is forging a great war machine, but the German Kaiser is said to possess a kind heart. He visits an orphanage, for it is a kingly thing to do well and be evil spoken of. Suffer little children. While America toys with imperialism, her president advises soft speech and a big stick. Here is the panoply of a world at war. King George V comes to the throne of England as the chief gentleman of a world soon to perish under the flame and thunder of guns. A royal and Queen Mary leave for the palace. These great ladies never meet again. While in Vienna, the saddest old man in Europe, the Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria, totters through his of Mexico. Tragedy shadows the Habsburg house. Assassination is commonplace. Surviving heir to the Austrian throne is the Archduke Ferdinand. The camera finds him at the wedding of the Archduke Karl to Zita, an imperious princess. Ferdinand's wife, the Duchess of Hohenberg, stands beside the emperor. He is to meet his death. But today, there is a wedding. In the patchwork kingdoms of the Balkans, the old army game was never interrupted by the passing of the centuries. King Ferdinand of Bulgaria was called the Fox of the Balkans. For a thousand years, it has been tacked against Christian. His generals counted the Turkish prisoners. King Nicholas of Montenegro. There were other such kings, but they have been forgotten. Italy had an alliance with Germany and Austria, but she was building battleships for a king and queen to launch. While young Alfonso of Spain could not foresee the future, Germans. Gott mit uns. Sturm und Drang. Drang nach uns denn. A place in the sun. Goose stepping. 
Mátala. The crown prince wears his favorite uniform, that of a death's head bazaar. In the midst of a world sharpening its swords, names Woodrow Wilson president and indulges in the luxury of a few mild reforms. Great names in American history, William Howard Taft, Viscount Bryce, the British ambassador, Count von Bernstorff, the German ambassador, Uncle Joe Cannon, Charles Evans Hughes, and William Jennings Bryan. Said Wilson, this is not a day of triumph. It is a day of dedication. Here muster not the forces of party, but the forces of humanity. The Kaiser, thinking of glory in the German arms, dedicates a monument to his forefathers at Leipzig, 100 years after they had defeated Napoleon in the Battle of the Nations. Followed by his three German kings, Saxony, Württemberg, and Bavaria, in the full regalia war. Germans completed the Kiel Canal, which gave its high seas fleet places of waiting against the day when the warlord would give the word. German ships maneuver in the cold waters of the North Sea. And great men of war swing into battle lines. Their officers drinking a toast to their heart. And the Kaiser's son, the Crown Prince, Eitel Friedrich and Joachim were soldiers too. The warlord is ceaseless, indefatigable, as he makes the rounds of his armies. Archduke Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian throne, shapes the other half of the Teutonic war machine. Caesars, Ferdinand and the Kaiser, hunted together and talked of days when German arms were born over many victorious fields. This was their last meeting.
black caskets carry Ferdinand and his wife to Vienna. They are the prelude to slaughter. Berlin, the Germans know the hour of glory is at hand. Russia mobilizes, and with his uncle, the Grand Duke Nicholas, with a white moustache, reviews the army. Ten million men will be enough to crush the Germans. The Kaiser and the King of Württemberg make ready to sweep the field with their marvelous new games. The other German king will help. These men are to go to Moscow, Paris, London. The Crown Prince will command an army. Von Mackensen will fight the Romanians. They go step before their emperor and before the son of their emperor. Frenchmen, still smarting from an earlier beating in 1871, know that though war is hell, sometimes Frenchmen must walk across its flaming coals. The French president, Poincaré, and General Jacques look on. The Kaiser stands by the side of the road and is a friend of every man. joins the Battle Royal. The King, his uncle, his son, send the little army, the Kaiser said, contemptible little army, over the old road, the road to Calais. Somehow in Turkey, the Sultan dreams that he must join the Christians to fight other Christians. It becomes a sacred Mohammedan duty. Louvain in Belgium, with its golden books, was burned. Ah me, where 
when shall I see the thin, sad slates that cover up my home? Serbia, watch as the shells falling into Belgrade. The bombardment of Belgrade. Once again, an English army crosses the channel to stand in battle line. This time, pitching its tents among the French and facing Australians come 10,000 miles to heed the call of English blood. A retired general named Paul von Hindenburg is made commander of the Germans who will oppose the Russians. The German emperor stands on the sand dunes of Belgium and looks upon his men. England is across the channel. And these men want to see London. And Frenchmen burrow in to stem the German tide. Some of these men will stay four years in this earth. Many will remain here forever. They are halting von Kluck's drive on Paris. General Gallieni's army leaves Paris for the front. And for the first time, men go to battle in taxicabs. 